Hey everyone, welcome to the Cats Ready to Librarians. I'm Simona and I'm joined by my hosts. Amanda. Yay. Ben. Yay. Louis. Joe. Okay, I'm gonna be your choice. Yay. <laughs> All right, so today we have a fun episode for you. We're gonna be talking. Don't dig in the energy, Simona. Oh, I thought you were gonna tell me it wasn't recording. I would have given up at that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we're done for the day. <laughs> so today we're gonna be discussing our film favorites. So I'm very excited because we got some film buffs in here, not including myself. So I'm always excited to see what everyone else has to say. But um, who wants to start us off? I'll start. Great. Ooh. Ooh, I like that initiative. Yes. I should also uh, uh, say that these are also movies we feel that everybody should watch. Yeah. So watch it. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to start with... Uh, a movie that came out in 1998 or 1999, uh, American Beauty. Mm -hmm. um, this movie was kind of like, like the movie that made me want to do things with movies, like back when I was younger. Um, it, uh, it was the first time I ever really think I noticed um, a director telling a story using visuals. Um, it's a really, uh, it was really profound for me at the time. I mean, I was probably like eight or nine when it came out, but I think I watched it at a pretty young age. I think I watched it like at 12. And um, it really, it still has a, an impact on I me. Mean, it always had uh, an impact. And um, Sam Mendes, very underrated as a director, I think. I mean, 1917, he won an Oscar for that. And then um, even Skyfall, I think, was the visually the best of the Daniel Craig Bond movies. It helps that Roger Deakins was the um, cinematographer. Can't yeah. be Roger Deakins. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but uh, <laughs> but yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start there. Well, maybe Robert Richardson can. Oh well, yeah. Now you're just talking about <laughs> gods versus gods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. No, yeah. That, I think that was that was about it. Yeah. Sam Mendes. Jeez. Do we? Is he underrated anymore, though? I mean, he's had two Bond films that have gotten near or crossed a billion dollars. He when, went ahead and did 1917, which, you know. Yeah. When um, you think of, like, when, or at least personally, when I think of, like, when I think of, like, the elite directors, I don't think his name pops up at first. Maybe it should, though. And maybe that's what you're saying is, is maybe yeah. he should be thought of in that vein. I mean, I think of, like, Road to Perdition, uh, Jarhead. No. Um, I think about Revolutionary Road. I don't like Revolutionary Road. I don't like it that much. Either. Well, I mean, I don't think it's made to make anyone happy. It's like, <laughs> no. if you want like movies that but, like show you like how bad it all is, it's like Revolutionary Road, Blue Valentine, yeah, yeah. and um, Shadow Street. of Violence, I think. Like, With Revolutionary Road, I was just kind of watching it and I was like, I wish this was a little more jagged. Yeah. Like, I wish this was more like Cassavetes than it is. Yeah. But, I mean, that's an insane request for anything starring. <laughs> big stars in the yeah. 2000s. <laughs> but cool, solid Cassavetes reference. If you want to watch Cassavetes films, just get yourself the Criterion channel. It's all yes. there. <laughs> or check out our library. <laughs> <laughs> check your library first. Uh, check the yes. library. <laughs> it's free. Yeah. True. Yeah, so that's, that's all I'll start. Uh, all right, I'll start off with a, with a goofier pick. Uh, the Last Dragon. This is a, from 1985, it's a kung fu movie, and it is produced by Barry Gordy of Motown Records. So, this is set in uh, Manhattan, about, and it stars Ty Mac, a martial artist, and uh, he's, his character is Leroy Green, a.k.a. Bruce Leroy, because he is <laughs> obsessed with Bruce Lee and seeks to emulate him in every way. And uh, there's also Vanity in there, one of Prince's protégés. Awesome. Awesome lady. Uh, there's a song she sings in it that is just insane. It feels like it's like seven verses long with no chorus. Astounding. Uh, there's also an expert needle drop, a rhythm of the night in there. Uh, <laughs> one of the main villains is Shonuff, the Shogun of Harlem. I love oh his God. character. Oh my God. Shonuff is the best. <laughs> but yeah. The movie's crazy. It's such a great time. Every time I watch it, just a big smile on my face all the way through. I can't help but recommend it. I haven't seen it. 
Uh, I'll have to happening. watch I'll it. Watch I love now. cheesy 80s movies, and this sounds right up my alley. Yes, yes. This will deliver <laughs> if you're looking for something cheesy. With a character already movies. sold me called Shonov. Shonov. I'll have to, um... <laughs> Bruce Leroy thing. Yeah. I haven't seen it either. Yeah. Bruce Leroy. And that's the whole point of this podcast, is to inspire new viewings. Yes, so we can hit one million subscribers. Make it happen, folks. Yes. That's right. Invite your friends. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, so skipping right over Simone. Uh, it's okay, we can skip. One. No, it's okay. Go, you go. My bad. <laughs> no. I guess we don't have to go in a circular order here. It makes me feel better if we have like order. I never lose track of going in a circular order. Right, order is always you know. Okay. Cheers. So Simone, go. All right. So my first film is Twelve Angry Men, which was released in 1957. So the principal cast is Martin Balsam, Henry Fonda, Lee J. Cobb, E.G. Marshall, Jack Klubman, Ever Bins, and a few other like really great actors. Um, it's a film that I've watched numerous times. It literally takes place in one room, and it's the story of these 12 jurymen who have to decide the fate of this young boy who's been accused of murdering his father. And the film explores prejudice and how prejudice clouds how we view a person, how we view a situation, and even how we can view quote-unquote evidence that's been presented um, by an attorney or a, you know, so it's, it's a really great film. My father actually had to watch it when he was on, when he was selected as a jury for the very reason that I think most jury people should watch this because prejudice really does cloud how you view, view a person. And it's just a fantastic film. It's just all these great actors in one room. And I've watched it numerous times, and I would really recommend it. For a fun viewing experience for you, in 2009, there was a Russian remake of the film, just I called 12. Oh. And it, I think it's about the, they're, they're prosecuting a, a Chechen teenager. Uh, it's almost three hours long but it's riveting from beginning to end. And I think if you're that much of a fan of 12 Angry Men, you might get more out of it than most people did. Although it got, I think it was nominated for an Oscar oh, for best uh, international film that year. Definitely, I think you might, I think you might dig it. Cool, thank you for the recommendation, Amanda. So my list, I, I, I kind of went more in the anime direction because I felt like there are a lot of movies you can tell people to watch, but I feel like there's some underrated like People under it estimate, like, you know, animation, animated films. And I feel that there are a lot that have really impacted, like, the movies that I feel like you guys have all seen. We've all seen. I feel like a lot of them do it. Um, my first one is actually Ghost in the Shell, the 1995 anime that came out. Um, it was 1996 for the U.S., but 95 for Japan. Um, you've probably heard of Ghost in the Shell. They did a live-action one with Scarlett Johansson, but I don't recommend that one until you've seen like the entire series. Um, it's kind of the penultimate sci-fi deep dive of what it means to, it, it was a scientific look, it's not scientific, a sci-fi look at what a soul meant and what it meant to be a person and what it meant to be real and stuff like that. And there were a lot of things that were really provocative and not just provocative, but kind of controversial about Ghost in the Shell. And it still kind of is very thought provoking today. And it very much is also a product of the fact that if you read the original source material, it's very different from its source material. I mean, like incredibly 100% basically differed from its source material to give it this serious feel. And the animation just within the first 10 minutes of the movie has one of the most iconic like scenes when you watch Motoko go through the whole like restructuring of her entire body frame as she has like a huge like robot. It's mechanically beautiful. It's hand-drawn animation at its finest. The music fits so well tonally. The background imagery is fantastic, beautiful. It's a post-apocalyptic, very dirty looking gritty city. And it's it's a noir. It's beautiful. I love everything about it. I honestly highly recommend it. I know we have it here at the library too. Do you like I, it more than Enchanto? Yes. <laughs> I can watch Ghost in the Shell like fifty billion times. The voice acting Enchanto, is also only super. Six times. Gotcha. Look here. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk <laughs> about Disney <laughs> on here. 
<laughs> I watched uh, Ghost in the Shell for the first time last year, and it, oh. it blew my mind. It's so cool. I'm like, it's one of those movies where you watch it and you realize that like everything else you've watched has ripped it off <laughs> a million times, mm -hmm. and it, uh, it, that's always so much fun to see. <laughs> well, it's interesting because like with the live action, there was a lot of hate. For the live action as a fan myself i actually didn't mind the live action too much it just felt that though they took the philosophical concept and they kind of tried to shove it they tried to make it too easy for you to figure it out instead of making it, it thought provoking it just sort of feels like there already is an american live action version the well matrix. what's interesting is that people pretty much <laughs> in a sense but whereas matrix tries to take the philosophical concept of like free will and tries to answer that question in its own void there Ghost in the Shell talks more about, um, like, is the soul an actual, like, is it a physical thing? Is it a more of a, like, a religious spiritual thing? Like, what is it? And it's very interesting, especially, I think the big controversy for Ghost in the Shell's live action was the fact that they cast Scarlett Johansson, an American woman who was not Japanese, but the creator came out and said he loved Scarlett Johansson. He always envisioned that's what Motoko would look like in a world where you can change your appearance at will. He had never envisioned his heroine to be Japanese in the first place. And that's where I think a lot of people got a little misguided on that whole thing. And it makes sense. And my favorite character got his own little side story and I was very excited. All the characters will, character, character will, <laughs> all the characters are super likable. Everybody's great and even its TV shows do such a good job at trying to like get you more into their lives and it's so good was there a second movie that came out a few years ago there was ghost in the shell innocence which came out i think a couple of years after the first one which was a sequel um was there it? was it was good it was it's not as good as its original as the sequels tend to never really be as cool um innocence was i'm not gonna really go into innocence because it's been a while and i haven't watched that one as much um I will say the live action did have an Easter egg for that movie, though, was the dog. But wasn't there like one called like, I don't know, like Lonely Complex? Or Standalone something? Complex was a TV show. Uh, okay. They had a movie for it. I actually own both. And then there was a second season to Standalone Complex, and they did a movie for that one, too. And they're all worth watching, but not all quite of them? as... Yeah, no, not as great as the first one. Standalone Complex did a fantastic job. And it's all in English, and you can find it. I'm sure someone in the system has it. If not... I'm sure it's available online somewhere. Um, Maybe we can get the person that orders DVDs to order it. Yeah, I'm not donating mine. <laughs> Ever. Um, they did, Netflix did do their own Ghost in the Shell, but I haven't watched it as I'm afraid to watch it with the animation choice they chose for it. It looks kind of janky. <laughs> so I'll probably give it a shot at some point because I really like Ghost in the Shell. So <laughs> I'll pass it on <laughs> to Ben. Oh, geez. Um... So, must watch as in like what we think are the best out there, or must watch in like what we watch the most constantly over and over? That's a good question. What's the criteria? That's a good question. Simona said best movies. I wasn't coming in here, or our favorites. I wasn't coming in here thinking favorites. I also wasn't coming in here thinking best. But I'd say most watchable. Okay. Yeah, I'm going with movies that are that are like a blast. That you can like devour and yeah. watch again maybe two times in the same yeah. night kind of yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So in twenty fifteen a movie was released that some brilliant person decided that the most energetic writer in Aaron Sorkin would be paired with the most energetic filmmaker in Danny Boyle to make the story of Steve Jobs. And good lord, it is unbelievable this movie is so you would never think a movie that takes place like in three acts backstage before premiere of a product would be even interesting to watch let alone just absolutely compelling storytelling it's I rhymed uh it is just visually magnificent the the it it's like watching an action film just because of how you know these masters of acting uh, Fassbender, uh, Aunt Stuhlbarg, mm -hmm. um, Kate Jeff Daniels, Kate, Kate Winslet owns that movie. Mm -hmm. um, Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen does great. Yeah. He, does a really good job. he stepped up. Yeah. And uh, God, he looks like he's going to be awesome in that uh, Pam and Tommy TV yeah. series. Yeah. yeah. Um, Steve Jobs has, not only does it like 
tick all the boxes for like just brilliant direction and performances. Um, it really does evoke, I mean, for people like us, our age, what it was like back then, where you were on like the cusp of all this new technology that wasn't there yet. Like, you know, we'd go about our day not having a phone to look at. We'd, you know, all, we'd go about our day not having a computer to carry around. We would just, and it, even like as far as like the, uh, the, uh, What's it? The, who makes the soundtrack? What are they called? The people? People who make the soundtrack? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a word for them. And sound, I don't know. The musical... <laughs> the music people. <laughs> the artist who made the soundtrack, um, whose name slipped in my mind, I think is like the best out there today. He also did King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. Um, he also did um, some, oh, uh, Into the Spider-Verse. Uh, he's really just a dynamic... Uh, Musician, me finding the name. <laughs> Daniel Pemberton. Daniel Pemberton. Uh, you got me. This movie, I mean, from what I hear, it is not particularly accurate to the, who these people really were, and they still made Steve Jobs pretty much an asshole, uh, and still apparently were, they didn't go far enough. Uh, I can see that. But it is just electric uh, watching, and it's emotionally engaging. It's just, it is a force of nature in a little two-hour film. Yeah. And, you know, it felt like they got things right, that uh, that Ashton Kutcher version just, like, butchered. Well, the Ashton Kutcher version was like, look at God here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Look at God hold this iPod. I didn't, right. I didn't watch the Ashton Kutcher one, but it felt very much like the Dewey Cox version of it. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, and I have to say, the soundtrack is probably my most listened to soundtrack, bar none. Like, Daniel Pemberton's soundtrack for Steve Jobs. Watch this movie. Watch it twice in a day. Watch it three times in a day. There's a standoff between Jeff Daniels and Michael Fassbender. That's the stuff that should be in every greatest moments in acting. Jeff Daniels does a good job of... Yeah, he's basically born for Aaron Sorkin. I like, I think I watched The Newsroom, which I thought was a show I would never watch in my life because it didn't, it just didn't seem like a show that I mm -hmm. personally would watch. But I sat down, he was just, he was the reason I stayed for the show. He was so fantastic yeah. the entire time and he just plays that role so well. I can be very mixed on Sorkin, but I think when he's paired with a great director, yeah. he that's really when it shines. Like I, I was just with Fincher and with Boyle, I think that's the perfect marriage of his yeah. writing to direction. I, I think Daniel Boyle and I think that's that. This was like to me Sorkin's finest moment in movies was Steve Jobs. As much as I like his other movies, yeah, I think he's a little. I didn't love the Chicago Seven as much as I guess everyone else did, and I thought Molly's Game was better than most people thought it was, um, but I haven't seen this one, the I Love Lucy one yet. Oh, the one with Javier Bardem and... Uh... He, was, he was frustrating me in his interviews leading up to it, so I've been avoiding it, because like, how can you make a Lucy movie and then go on and be like, I don't think I Love Lucy's funny at all. It's like, Wait. why did you make this? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I liked Molly's Game too, and I have... I have uh, thoughts about that that I'll talk about off camera, but um, I thought that uh, the social network, and again, I don't know if it's just, it's, uh, it's more David Fincher and he just seems to have that ominous music all the time with him, and like for some reason whenever there's like a Sorkin pause, like that ominous music plays, and I'm like, that's like a perfect match. Was that match. Reznor's yep. first film score? Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor, that was the, I think that was their first uh, pairing Reznor. for a movie. And then they did Soul, knocked it out of the friggin' park. I forgot they did Soul. God, incredible. I mean, they did it 10 something years later, but still. <laughs> still good. Um, so, the next movie I'm going to talk about is a movie that I have watched as recently as New Year's Day. Uh, goes to show you how exciting my New Year's was. But um, I'm sitting there. <laughs> Playing. We were all home on New Year's, man. It was well, the pandemic. Sure. <laughs> of course, yes. But, uh, you know, I'm sitting there with a few friends and we're, we're playing Uno. And um, I, I just, I, they eventually, they, they pushed me out of the game because I just could not stop watching the movie. And that's how I am every time I watch this movie. 
I think it's captivating uh, in Glorious Bastards. I just can't get enough of it. <laughs> I think every single time I watch it, I'm just like hooked instantly. I think every scene is amazing. I think every bit of dialogue is amazing. Um, speaking of Fastbender, I love the scene in the bar. Yeah. Oh, the three. oh that's right. You did that. Yeah. Yep. yeah. It's just like, it's just, uh, it's Tarantino at his best, but you could say that about, like we said in the one episode, you could say that about any Tarantino movie. Um, it really, uh, Brad Pitt is phenomenal in it. Oh my God. He's <laughs> like, uh, well, I'm the most Italian here, and you're third most. I'm speaking of Italian. Italian. Exactly. <laughs> third most. Yeah. It's, a, it's downstairs on our, on our movie display in an unofficial uh, double feature with Django Unchained, by the way. Also great. I actually just watched that very recently, mm -hmm. too. Which I think might be Tarantino's best, but God and Glorious Bastards is exactly what you say. Yeah. It is just, yeah, it's... It, it, it's just like, he's firing in all cylinders for that one. Yeah. It's a vacuum. Like, it turns on and, yeah, I'm just, there's nowhere I can go. I'm just yeah. it, it lured. You are yeah. so right. It's one of my choices. Yeah. And you know, there's uh, the one part where um, the, I forget her name, Gretchen, I think, has just gotten shot in the leg, and they're in the, the doggy, the, the veterinarian hospital, and um, she's like, she's about to tell him that uh, the Fuhrer is going to be at the premiere, and like everyone, in, and all the people I was watching, watching this movie with weren't watching it, and I was like, you guys have, she's about to, She's about to do something huge, guys, watch! And, and then she says, the Fuhrer will be in attendance, and they're like, I don't get it. And I was like, you guys suck, I'm never watching anything with you ever again. Yeah. And I hope that they're watching this. <laughs> so, wait, was her, was her announcement the big thing that she does? You, have, you haven't seen this yet either? No. Oh man, you're in for a treat. Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen clips, clips it's a good one. but I don't know if it's like too violent for me. I mean, I've seen violent, but... I think there's like one scene where it's in like more violent than others, but other than that, it, I don't think it's like super brutal. But then ends, my level of brutal is technically... Yeah, um, it, it ends very cute. violently, but in a way that's very satisfying. And yeah. Quentin Tarantino's very good about making the violence like cartoony almost like again, there's I watched Kill Bill and I enjoyed Kill oh, Bill. Oh, so. yeah, it'll be fine. Compared to Kill Bill. You're fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you can watch the crazy 88s. No scenes, no no scene skipping in this Kill one. Bill <laughs> down No scene skipping in this one. That's right. Yeah. Good call. It's all important. Good call. It's all important. <laughs> Every scene is brilliant. You won't want to skip any scenes. And it's downstairs in the library as an official double feature on our DVD display. I mean, I've seen clips. Like, I watched the clip where um, they're interrogating the Nazi commander and they bring the Jewish character out with the baseball bat. The bear Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Such a great movie. And it's so terrifying because, <laughs> like, you're hearing him banging against the walls first, and you're it's really building up. Like, I was terrified for the Nazi com And I know you're not supposed to be terrified for the Nazi commander, but I was like, oh, my Lord. And, and it's, yeah, so that was an awesome scene. And like I said, I watched Kill Bill, so, like, why yeah. am I even... You'll be fine. I'll yeah. be fine. As a matter of fact, you, if you have time, did you see Django Unchained? No. You should probably take home that double feature. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah. Good call. Yeah. I love talking about great movies. Yeah. All right. Uh, my next one, Phantom of the Paradise. So, you know, everyone knows Rocky Horror. We've all seen it a million times, whatever. British and US versions. <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise, better. It's way better. In terms of 70s glam rock musicals, this can't be beat. Yeah. Brian De Palma, it has a soundtrack by none other than Paul Williams, who brought us such classics as The Muppet Christmas Carol, and <laughs> and do you guys know like what Paul Williams looks like? I don't. He's a tiny man with very long blonde hair and like big goofy glasses, and he plays the <laughs> villain in this. Oh wait, and I've seen him. It is the most delightful villain performance I've ever seen. Oh, what else <laughs> has he been in that I've definitely seen him in? But yeah, this movie, it rocks. If you're looking for something to fill that Rocky Horror itch, this is it. I, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, the lead actress in it is Jessica Harper, who uh, is actually the lead in Suspiria as well. Which and Suspiria? The... the original. Okay, sorry. I have to, like... <laughs> I think she has a role in the new one, too. She I might have played one of the witches though. in that one. She might have played one of the elders. Yeah. 
Because that's usually how they do those cameos out uh, years later. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's just, it's an amazing time. It's a riff on uh, Phantom of the Opera, a little bit of uh, Dorian Gray thrown in there too. Very gothic, very fun. Give it a watch. Oh no, that's going on the list. I heard Dorian Gray, it's my favorite book. It's in there. <laughs> Alright, so my second movie is Come Back, Lil Sheba, released in 1952, and I actually a few years ago had the pleasure of actually watching the stage production, which was really good. Um, so this film stars Burt Lancaster, Shirley Booth, Terry Moore, and um, for those that don't know, it's essentially about a man named Doc Delaney, played by Lancaster, and his wife Lola, played by Booth. And essentially the main character Lola is in a state of deep depression. She literally cannot even find the energy to get up, comb her hair. Uh, Doc Delaney is a recovering alcoholic and you learn that essentially he was a promising doctor but he got Lola pregnant and at that time that meant you know you gotta get married. They got married and his dreams were sort of derailed from that moment on. So they also lost their child at a very young age. So it's essentially, he is very bitter, very frustrated. She is very depressed and very frustrated as well because she and Doc almost can't really communicate with one another. I kind of like it in dark. I feel like we... If it goes dark again, Joe won't um, do anything. <laughs> uh, and And... Into their lives comes this young girl played by Terry Moore, um, and Doc sort of looks upon her almost as like a chance to see beauty and innocence again because unfortunately he also views his wife as the reason why his dreams were derailed. The fact that they had sex, it's a very big deal. It's not explicitly stated, obviously. Very this mean girl's this, statement. Yeah, it's like, was, sex and die. Yeah, so there, <laughs> it was the 50s, but you know that he views what they did as, you know, one sin led to another sin, and he sort of views this young girl as his chance to see goodness and purity. Goes without saying, uh, his I ideal of this girl is sort of blown, and I won't say anything more. But it is still a beautiful story. Granted, some people may not like some of the outdated ideologies, like especially alcoholism. There's this heartbreaking scene when he says, alcoholism, men who suffer from it is because they're unsatisfied within their marriages. So it's a heartbreaking scene because he's essentially blaming Lola for his alcoholism. But I won't say any more. It still is a very beautiful film. If you can look past some dated notions that are present in the film, it still is worth a watch. It's a beautiful, I cry every time I watch it. It's a beautiful film. Mm. Um, it's really heavy, but it's, it's worth a watch because they're fantastic actors. I think movies that have heavy themes tend to be, at least, like, they can be hard to nail, but when they do, they, they do a fantastic job, and they end up being some of my favorite movies. Uh, like my next choice. Uh, um, so, my next choice is an anime film that came out in 1997 called Perfect Blue, which I've mentioned a couple times on this podcast. I can't get enough of Perfect Blue. Um, directed by a man named Satoshi Kon, who also did Paprika, which inspired Inception. Um, Perfect Blue also inspired another American movie, which happens to be another one of my personal favorites, uh, Black Swan. Um, Black Swan is utterly one of my favorite to go to films that I will watch whenever possible. She may mention it later in this podcast. To you. I will not. <laughs> I actually thought it was a good segue into that one. <laughs> I highly recommend Black Swan. It's very tough to watch. Um, it's very, it's made to definitely make you, your guts kind of wrench. It is hard to watch. It's but uncomfortable. But I so think that's the powerful. point. Yeah, so it's got a powerful yeah. message. And I also love the story of Swan Lake. So mixed with Black Swan, it's like, you know, a fantastic duality. Um, so Perfect Blue was the inspiration for Black Swan, as the director has come out to say. Um, Perfect Blue is was a movie that was created in its time, but it was ahead of its time. It was a movie that was made too soon because it fits more in today's because of the... It's not just the story of an ex-singer who becomes a movie star and you watch her like through the stressful roles and the dark side of the entertainment industry as she's has a stalker who gets quite 
violent <laughs> and all things like that. Um, it also talks about this, the duality of having your online personality or how people have perceived you versus who you are as a person and how you can kind of get lost in that role because the whole point of the stalker in Perfect Blue is that he saw her as her idol self. And in Japan, idols put on a character or celebrities, you should say, put on a character whenever you see them perform singers it doesn't mean that they're not true to themselves but they are creating a persona for entertainment purposes especially in the japanese media when it comes to like their idols they have to present a certain way they're selling an image they're selling an image and unfortunately sure, this like. girl sold an image that somebody <laughs> really really liked and so you know he followed her online he followed her at her concerts and even followed her into her debut into like you know TV shows and movies and stuff like that. And he tells her flat out, he's like, you're not who, like, you're not this person. You're, you're an imposter. But is she really an imposter? It's hard because you have today with everybody kind of being online, we have our personas online versus who we are outside of the online persona. And it can get hard to differentiate who you really are versus like what you're presenting to other people. So it's a very deep thought film as Satoshi Kon's films always do. And the artist he chooses, and I forget if it's him who does the animation. I know he's an animator himself, but he always uses this particular animator who can just turn people into either being utterly beautiful into being utterly grotesque. Like some of their eyes are really spaced out, the wrinkles on the face. It's honestly, hey. it creates... <laughs> <laughs> The way he does it is creepy, all right? He creates, like, monsters, that people are monsters. It is a good film. It's like, a fantastic film, and it is based on two novels. There's one... Mo the Perfect Blue is originally based off the original novel, um, which is still very gut-wrenching and hard to watch, especially with some of the substance in it. But once you kind of get down into it, it's a fantastically animated film, and Satoshi Kon never disappoints when it comes to any of the psycho-thrillers. I honestly highly recommend it for anybody. It's These films are adult, and they're made to be viewed as such. These aren't children's movies. Yeah, just these want to are, clarify that. <laughs> these are adult films, and they are beautiful, and anybody can watch them at any time. I don't think we own it. I've been trying to find a good copy for the library for years, though, because <laughs> it goes in and out of the market. <laughs> so um, definitely check it out. I, it's beautiful, beautiful. This is getting tough because the more we're talking about all these films, all these other ones are popping into my head. And at 40 something years old, I'm not being specific, it's, <laughs> there, there's been a lot of films that I've watched a lot. It's, yeah. And now we have to basically, we only have 30 more minutes to talk about this stuff. Oh God, we make this a part all right. one. All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to go with The Fountain. Uh, the director of Black Swan, actually, uh, but it was. A movie that Darren Aronofsky made, I think, came out in 2006, but was officially released in 2005. Um, it is a movie about, like, uh, a love story that's told through generations, or through, not generations, through centuries. Um, it's to talk about, like, beautiful soundtracks. And beautiful visuals. It might be, oh yeah, it is. The, the, there's a, a segment of the movie that's called The Last Man. Um, and it's uh, the same character, but basically traveling through space and time in like a little life bubble, uh, waiting to revive the love of his life. Uh, this movie got, I think, beat up a little too much when it came out. I th um, it felt like the most personal thing Darren Aronofsky has ever made. I mean, you get a touch of like, his, you know, he's an environmentalist and you can see that when you watch Noah, but like... Um, this movie, The Fountain, is probably like the, one of the best love stories ever made. Uh, it's very brave. It's very raw. Um, me and my uh, brother, we kind of cornered him at a Q&A, uh, Darren Aronofsky, about 10 years ago, where he said that, where I asked him, you know, I, you mentioned an article that you were working on your director's cut of this, and he like lit up and he's like, I still am doing it. And I promise, like, that's coming. And that's been 10 years, Darren. 
So, uh, <laughs> great. This is, um, I'm waiting for like this, the final book in the Name of the Wind series and your Cut of the Fountain. Uh, everyone should watch this movie. It's, it, it's so much about like what life is supposed to be and what we try to make it and uh, how you view loving someone and what that means and what you think it means and what you think you must do versus what you really, like it's a lot about, um, you know, we have a value of holding on, holding on, holding on and this one's a lot about not holding on. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful movie that makes you feel happy somehow, so watch it. Well, you guys kind of went with such heavy, heavy hitters there. I was going to go with Baby Driver next. Yes. Which is, which is yeah. much less intense than the three movies just mentioned. It's got its own brand of intense. But uh, it does. It's got um, Kevin Spacey. That's intense. It does have Kevin like Spacey. Kevin Spacey. <laughs> um, As an actor. <laughs> we didn't get the Christmas message this year from him. No. That actually weirdly made me forgive him. I'm sorry, we're sidetracking from the movie. Though. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but then Alex Winter came out and I was like, oh yeah, no. That was still, yeah. But um, Baby Driver, I know it goes off the rails a little bit at the end, but it's fun. That opening uh, car chase is oh, just yeah. so exciting and so much fun to watch. And what an amazing soundtrack. I mean, just really, uh, we should probably do a whole episode where we talk about soundtracks. We're talking a lot about music today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just a really, really fun movie. Um, I'm also a huge John Hamm fan. I oh, think he's yes. just brilliant in everything he does. Um, he needs more movie roles. Agreed. He, yeah. he, I, I don't know why he is not like the most popular actor yeah. ever lived. Everyone because... just sees him as Don Draper, I think. But... He's so good, yeah. even if he's just doing Don Draper again. Yeah. yeah, honestly, they should just do a movie where he's just Don Draper again, and I would, I would watch that movie. And but, John Bernthal. Also. Yeah, oh, he's yes. Too. Yeah, I love the one part, too, where the, uh, the one guy has, uh, has all these tattoos on his neck, and I think Jamie Foxx asked him if that, if that affects his, like, the jobs that he gets or something, and he's like, no, no, I had it, or he had like a, I think he had the F word like tattooed on his neck, and he's like, no, 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 I, I changed it to freak or something, and they're like, yeah, that's what's keeping you from getting jobs, you know, the tattoos. It's just very funny, and it's a fun movie, and. Uh, I've just picked up. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, Last night in Soho. Yeah, um, I Dying. want to watch that. Yeah, that seen looks it really good. I love Edgar Wright. Just makes yeah. gold. Like. Yeah. I think The World's End is probably like my most watched Edgar Wright film, yeah. but they're all, all gold. I've not seen The World's End. Mm. I need to check it out. I've always heard good things about it, but it, it just never... I, I feel like it didn't get the same level of popularity it as did the not. other two. In the it deserved trilogy. more than all of them, but it did not get it. Alright, uh, I think I'm going to fall back on uh, my favorite movie, uh, Inherent Vice. 2014, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's the only adaptation of a Thomas Finch novel because who else would even try? <laughs> and yeah, it's set in 1970, Los Angeles. It's a, it's a comic noir and it follows Doc Sportello who uh, sort of just goes on a case uh, asked by his ex-girlfriend Shasta and gets in over his head. <laughs> and that's as much as I can say without rambling on for about 20 minutes because the plot's sort of weird and all over the place. But it's just such a beautiful movie. It's extremely funny. It has maybe... It, it has my the best Josh Brolin performance. I'm, I'm willing to say that. That's big talk. Look, you'll see him as Lieutenant Detective Christian F. Bigfoot Bjornsson, and you'll say, this is the only role this man should ever play. <laughs> it, it's the... He gives such an insanely funny performance, and he has such a beautiful, like, brotherly love-hate relationship with Joaquin Phoenix in it that's just lovely. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's got an amazing cast. You have Joaquin, Brolin, uh, Catherine Watterson, uh, Owen Wilson, Martin Short. It never ends, but it has a beautiful score by Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. And uh, it really touches on so, so many things. And it just, I think it really captures the feeling of a dying era 
very, very well, and uh, I think that's something rare and special. So yeah, check it out. <laughs> okay, so my next film, um, it's The Lord of the Rings, and honestly the entire trilogy is awesome. Yes. <laughs> cool. But, um, <laughs> but I decided to focus on The Fellowship of the Ring, because as with anything, when you first enter a world, that's sort of the best um, moments. It's the most magical. Um, and also, if you haven't watched the extended editions, I Only highly recommend. Only watch the extended editions. Because they're awesome. Uh, and yeah, so it was released in 2001. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because I'm sure most of you know about this film. But it's just so magical. It's such a beautiful film. Uh, the sets, the costumes, the music, it's really gorgeous. So if you haven't yet watched it for some strange reason, watch it. Now's a really good time, too, because Tolkien Day just passed, and it would have been his 130th birthday. Also, it's 20, it's hitting its 20th anniversary. It, it hit its 20th anniversary. It's the number one trilly. Exactly. So if there's a, not a better time to watch it than now, watch it. HBO Max has all the extended editions. We have the extended editions. Only watch the extended you editions. You only have two of them. Someone took it because they liked it that much. <laughs> <laughs> you should also read the books, which we have plenty of them here. Just And then read The Cimmerillion. Then, then read The Cimmerillion. Oh my god. Please, because Amazon, I think, since they're doing the Lord of the Rings TV show, it's been talked about. I think they're also doing The Cimmerillion, which I'm excited if you're a Tolkien head and you want to get deeper <laughs> into the lore of Middle Earth and everything. It's just, yes. So Maroon is really good if you need to fall asleep. <laughs> Look here. No, honestly, I I, 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 I I tried reading it. I really did. Like, honestly, I, I read the trilogy, and I know this is sacrilege. I know it. People are not going to like me for saying this. Good at world building, not so good with storytelling or characters. I think that's a pretty I popular opinion, will actually. <laughs> come at you. Yeah. I agree. I feel like it picks up in the Two Towers book, and then you're you're about basically to catch my hands. from the, two, the beginning of the Two Towers book until the end of the battle. It's very compelling, but man, once you go back to the freaking Shire, thank God, Jackson never filmed that. Even he knew better. But yeah, that was, I love those books. Well, it's I funny love... because in the Two Towers we were talking about, you ever meet, like, you ever watch Lord of the Rings with somebody who absolutely just loves it and they just go, did you know <laughs> about it? Me and, me and Brian were sitting there, we were watching Two Towers, because I was like, time to rewatch all four hours of, like, you know, every single movie. And we were watching the Helm's Deep battle, and Brian goes, you know what's great about this scene? I was like, what? And he was like, just wasn't in the books. And I'm just like, you're right. There is no battle for Helm's Deep in the books. That that is an entirely made up battle that they yeah, had. There's a battle for Helm's Deep in the books. Not like that. <laughs> that whole scene basically is improvised. Yeah, they, they improved they, upon it. They, yeah. they, I will say they did. But y'all about to catch my hands after this podcast. Because they kind of read, like, you can really tell Tolkien was inspired also by Arthurian legends. Because when you read because Arthurian legends... Because that's what he studied! Le I know, but when you read a legend, <laughs> they, the, the people in there read as larger than life, unrealistic. Like, the most realistic people, and I can totally understand why they want to be left alone, are the hobbits. I the like hobbits the hobbits don't do anything. They but, just stay there. Exactly. That's why I like them. They eat. They drink, they enjoy life, they want to like stay away from the rest of the world. And you see what happens when Frodo decided to leave the Shire? What happens when he, um, this in the was last all book? just an allegory for <laughs> Well, actually, Tolkien said he did not like allegories and he didn't write it to be an allegory. <laughs> Sorry. Like, you can read it as well. inspired because I, we also have the movie which talks about how Lord of the Rings was written. No. <laughs> I, I'm just going to share a bit of trivia I always love. You know who wanted to make a film ad adaptation of it? The Beatles. Really? Yeah, they I wanted Stanley so Kubrick to direct. I'm not into that. And <laughs> it was going to be... Uh, Ringo was... I think Ringo was Sam, Paul was Frodo, George was Gandalf, <laughs> and John was uh, Gollum, which I think would have been the funniest thing in the world. Uh, 
Yeah, but and uh, they were pretty close to actually getting it done, but Tolkien refused to give them the rights because he had a rock band that lived like across the street from him, and he hated hearing the noise, so he blamed it on the Beatles. I'm not gonna lie, I like the Beatles. Yeah. I don't think that would have. Uh, oh, I think it would have been a trip yeah. and a half. You know, I have to say um, about Fellowship of the Ring, the extended cut, that whole concerning Hobbits sequence that wasn't in the theatrical cut is an absolute joy. It's like it, the exact life I would want. It is, Just because like, happy. because a part of you sort of says, okay, well, you know, you should want to explore, you should want to go beyond what you know. And I can understand it, but at the same time, they embrace who they are wholeheartedly, and they have no desire to be anyone else but who they are. Yeah. And honestly, when you think about the elves, they're stuck up. Yes, I know they were the first creation of the gods, but they're stuck up. That's why they're leaving and they're dying off. Then you've yeah, got they're the... clearly better. Have you seen their fighting techniques? But <laughs> still, they're, they're stuck yeah. up know-it-alls, and that's either. why they're leaving Middle Earth. So, like, I like the hobbits. The dwarves don't care about anyone except gold. Yo, I'm for the dwarves. I would yeah, love just to be a dwarf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hide in the mountains, eat, drink, be merry. Let's go. Yeah, and mm-hmm. the humans are problematic as we always are. Humans are always problematic. But I love the Ents. Like, and speaking of trivia. I know that the Ents were based on C.S. Lewis, because C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were good friends. <laughs> yeah. And C.S. Lewis had this booming voice, so when you hear the Ent leader, and I can't remember what his name is. Treebeard. He, Treebeard. He was modeled after C.S. Lewis. <laughs> C.S. Lewis poked fun at Tolkien, calling his books boring. Look here, C.S. Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> Disney can't okay, even make Mr. your Hart. movies <laughs> all the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm always going to regret, is that like they started the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe series, and they only ended after the third book, <laughs> and they were just like, we're just not going to do this anymore, and I'm like, <laughs> they weren't great, but at the same time, I was like, I had no I problem really with wanted Prince to get Caspian. to the last battle. Prince Caspian, I had no problem with it all. I thought that was quite good. I just wanted to get to the, the final one. I was like, yeah, I was so for the magicians. I, just, I was just so ready for it, but then they were like, no, Harry Potter beat us. <laughs> and I was like, ooh. Um... I think for my final movie that I'm going to talk about, since I talked about two really heavy hitters, philosophically, psychologically, uh, I'm going to go something fun. Um, so my next recommendation is Interstellar 5555, the story of the secret star system, which yes. is Daft Punk's giant... Um, it's basically their entire out, al- one of their entire albums. I think it was uh, Discovery. Discovery. Um, which was animated by the legendary Leiji Matsumoto, who is known for a couple I was going to mention on here, Galaxy Express 999, Captain Harlock, which is a personal favorite anime of mine, Space Pirates, for the win. Um, an amazing, amazing music, amazing visuals, uh, not amazing visuals, but such a fun ride, talking about an alien amazing. band <laughs> who is so loved on their planet that their music makes their way to Earth, and an evil producer comes and steals them from their planet, and it's an adventure of this one guy trying to, the hero of the planet, coming to save them after they've been brainwashed into being a band on in the U.S. But you find out through the evil producer that every legendary singer on Earth was an alien. And it's great. It's It's a... Crazy ride, all the songs are great, the songs with the visuals are so fun, it is an animated film. You cannot get a DVD of it, unfortunately, because they have never re-released it. So anybody who owns it will sell it for like $500 online. I know, because I've been looking for it, <laughs> and I'm willing to buy a bootleg copy of it, because I really love it. Um, I hope one day that someone gets the rights to it again. Well, your it's promotion something. on this podcast, which will make it big, will make that happen. No, Just well, I'm American. It'll never make it. <laughs> ah. um, honestly, you can actually find it on YouTube. Which, or you can only see the music videos because I know later on they like cut the movie into just music video portions. So if you love Daft Punk and miss them dearly like I do already, I had bought a hoodie the day that they, uh, <laughs> the day that they decided to split. Um, and Tron, the next Tron movie will never be the same. Um, please check it out. It's, it's super fun. I love this movie. I've shown it to the anime club that's run here. Every year of, I get a new batch of kids. I always somehow find a way to show it and be like, look at this masterpiece. (laughs) It's so good. It's so much fun. And another killer soundtrack in Tron Legacy. We really should have a soundtrack day. 
Well, Disney just net, like they're not enough. But there's rumors that they're uh, they're bringing it back up. They're bringing Tron back it up. It all depends like, on how well Top Gun does. Because then they'll bring Joe Kaczynski back to direct the third Tron. Please, please, yep. please, 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 please. We need Top Gun to be well. <laughs> I'm a little worried about the the Top Gun movie. Don't be. Uh, yeah. Oh God, don't be. <laughs> the only thing, I mean, it does look cool because I guess Tom Cruise is actually flying mm. those jets. And he taught the other guys, what? taught the other actors to fly too. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's, insane. Fly it's insane that he waited till he was like middle age yeah. to like start doing like Jackie Chan stunts <laughs> and like just endangering his life constantly. Yes. This is funny that we're talking about Tom Cruise because that's going to be my next movie. Uh -huh. But yes, Top Gun's going to be a huge hit because of no one, you can't deny that kind of aerial photography that's all legit. Yeah. And if the actors aren't flying, Tom Cruise is. But if they aren't, they're still in the jet. Yeah, I was going to say, I think yeah. it's all legit happening. Yeah, Yeah, which is yeah, going to be some mind-blowing stuff. Yeah. It might be the one movie that gets me back into a theater. But uh, otherwise, I'm staying home. Uh, so, you want, I want, I'm not going to talk about Gladiator, even though I'd love to. I I'm just not, watched that again this one. weekend. I'm not going to talk about Man on Fire, Denzel Washington, even though I want to. I mean, there's too many. There's just Lots so many. Scott Brothers there. Yeah. Yeah. Speak right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just a shout out to 2015 as like maybe the best, one of the best years ever for big budget movies. That was the year you had Force Awakens, The Martian, you had, um... Was that Fury Road also? Mad Max Fury Road, mm -hmm. uh, Ex Machina, yeah. uh, that was Avengers, the one that no one likes as much, uh, so Age, of yeah. Age of Ultron. Um, you had Inside Out and, uh, the, Steve Jobs. Yeah. The Crown Jewel, 2015, and my number one movie that I can't stop watching, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Oh, that was so good. It is so good. <laughs> it is to talk about Tom Cruise doing wacky stunts. This might be, like, his least of his wacky stunts. He hangs onto the plane, um, and it, it's just the opening sequence of the movie, and it's just a lot of fun. But this is the movie where you're introduced to Ilsa Faust, who's probably the most important character in the Mission Impossible uh universe um that's you're also uh introduced to sean harris solomon lane uh, who's just a unique villain it contains i think my favorite sequence in all of movies and it's this opera uh scene oh that's oh. with an assassination attempt and there's not like there's no insane stunt there's nothing like like over the top happening it's just the most perfectly executed like tense joy making experience and that's what i think what that movie does it creates an absolute sense of exhilaration and joy um i know like the motorcycle chase was topped in the next mission impossible with the with in paris but like there's one in morocco that's just so gorgeous and so much fun and it ends in london it makes you want to travel again it's just it is really i it's probably like my top five favorite movies of all time, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. And I think the best of all the Mission Impossible movies by an inch and just so watchable. Mm. Watch it again and again and again. <laughs> I concur. Thank you. Um, the, I guess we'll, we'll go around real quick. Speed round. Speed round. Actually, the last one I was going to mention was <laughs> Mad Max Fury Road. Just, uh, just a fun movie just like can i say balls to the walls like the entire yeah. time like just just great i mean it's just it's tom hardy grunting the entire time i mean it really is just i mean he can grunt in just sawing off just thing yeah. Yeah. just a fun <laughs> fun movie and again roger deakins with the the visuals and the cinematography i mean just at his best and george miller at his best too um a couple of quick hitters win it all it's on netflix it's a gambling movie uh, starring Jay Johnson, awesome. Uh, Mississippi Grind, also a gambling movie, starring Ryan Reynolds and Ben Mendelsohn, also great. Um, and a, uh, Drive, Ryan Gosling, Flash. very good. And um, uh, a somber choice we talked about, kind of uh, your serious movies, the movie that always gets me, I do like Blue Valentine, but the movie that always gets me very emotional is uh, Manchester by the Sea. Uh, it, hits, it hits hard, um, and I'll leave it there. Uh, all right. Uh, obvious one, Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. Anytime this movie's on TV, 
glued to the screen. Uh, it can hop in at any point, hop out at any point. Just beautiful. Uh, you can't beat it. So much fun. Uh, yeah, Simona. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I had a last film, but then I wanted. I decided to change it up. So this is one of those films that I enjoy. It's like so bad, but it's so good. And it's Cyborg. Um, it's the 1989 American some martial arts cyberpunk film. Um, so, With Van Damme. Yes. So, like I said, it's one of those films where it's like... Oh, it's Alfred Pune. It's, it's not the greatest film ever made, but there is something still so enjoyable that it just keeps you coming back for more. So that's one that just popped into my head now. Like, I, we, I own it, and it's, it's, it's a fun film. But the other one that I had, the last one, is a Japanese animated film. Uh, it's a Studio Ghibli film. I love Studio Ghibli films. Um, this one is The Secret World of Arietti which was released in 2010. Such a gorgeous film. Um, that one was directed by his son. I think yeah. that was his... Uh, I'm not going to lie. Sorry, Goro. <laughs> Earthsea was your, your biggest flaw. Um, I think that was his comeback <laughs> film that made Miyazaki, his father, kind of maybe allow him to direct more movies. Allow him to be his Who son did again. when Marnie was there? Because that was like amazing. Uh, I think that was another Goro. All right. Yeah, that that's a gorgeous film as, as well. That one's highly underrated. That one's a really good. Also 2015. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what I love about the Studio Ghibli films is they're so visually stunning, and even in the simple moments, there's so much beauty. And Hayao Miyazaki is very much about the environment. You, It's very evident in a lot of his films. Even Howl's Moving Castle, where if you read the original novel, the war is like a footnote. But for the animated film, Hayao Miyazaki made that the focus. <laughs> it always takes me back. I feel like the power has cut out. Uh, makes it the focus of his film because it's very much an anti-war message and the damage that war can do on multiple levels. But yeah, Arietti is just a gorgeous film. Um, it ends on a bittersweet note, but it's a film that I can constantly go back to. All Studio Ghibli films are fantastic. Uh, another one which made me cry, which I still haven't watched it, because it was uh, was um, oh, uh, Grave of the Fireflies, which takes place during World War II, the bombing of Japan. It's devastating. Yeah. It's I, I bought the candy. Yeah, it's so emotionally gut wrenching and heartbreaking, which is probably why I have not watched it again. I cried during that movie, but it is still beautiful. Like I said, all their films are gorgeous would recommend them. We have them in the system. Yeah. I actually have Pleasant Valley's copy of Grave of the Fireflies, and it is heavily overdue, so I apologize. <laughs> I've actually been charged for it, but I'll bring it back. I know where it is. <laughs> it's funny because for a while, I think it was a couple of years back, I was still in like school, uh, they started branding uh, the candy that's in the movie, the candy that he gives to his sister. Oh, and I, I, I was in the store, and I was like, oh no. I was like, oh no. Not and me. I bought Not it. Here. I bought like two two <laughs> things of it, and I handed one to my sister. I'm like, here you go. She had just seen it. She was like, oh no. She's like, it tastes so good. <laughs> I'm just like, we're gonna cry. <laughs> um, uh, speed round for me. Uh, so I'm just gonna label four movies. I'm not gonna go into them. Uh, Akita. Everyone knows Akita. It's one of the essential like anime films that people know of. Uh, we have the manga for it, which has a lot more stuff in it. Um, the story is a little bit more different. Uh, highly recommend it. We have both the movie and the manga, so please watch them in tandem. Re-watch tandem. Um, Machia, When the Promised Flower Blooms. That's a gorgeous film. Um, fantastic film. The artist is someone who I really enjoy following online. I forget their name, but that's off the top of my head. Beautiful film about motherhood and what it actually means to love somebody and like familial, in a familial sense, and what it means to let go. It's a beautiful movie for mothers and their children. Um, a classic, Night on the Galactic Railroad. It's a cla It's a Japanese uh, children's story that has been produced into movies, animes, stage plays. It's a prolific story that still resounds today. It's beautiful. It talks mainly about like religion and faith, but and it's one of those films normally I would not watch because of that kind of a context, but it's a beautiful film nonetheless. Um, my last one I will say um, is Metropolis. It's an anime film. Uh, not the, uh, not the old sci-fi one, the not not the old sci -fi one <laughs> because it's really hard when you look at Metropolis, you have to put anime next to it or you're not going to find it. It's a 2001 film. Uh, it's based on Osama Tezuka's 
1949 manga. Um, Osama Tezuka did things like Astro Boy and Unico and so many other things. He's probably the most famous person in Japan of all time. He's the, per he's the first anime that we had in the U.S. Um, Metropolis is a more dark take on the things that we know and we love from him. And it actually kind of opened my eyes to the fact that he can't, he doesn't just write children's stories like Astro Boy, very childish things. He writes prolific, political, dark, psychological stories. And Metropolis is one of those ones that shows more of a, like, it's called Diesel Punk. It's a Diesel Punk drama film and it's a noir. It's about a detective trying to figure out with his little sidekick um, what's going on in this city when they find a robot girl, kind of like Alita, but Osama Tezuka style. <laughs> so fantastic. I believe we own that one here too. Those are four anime films I feel like everyone should watch at least once in their lifetime. These are not always made for children, except for Night on the Galactic Railroad and maybe Machia. Um, but the rest are definitely ones that if you're an adult and you can still appreciate the art of animation in these films. All right. So the final speed run. Uh, three neo-westerns. Um, Taylor Sheridan uh, is a god of writing. He is, as he puts it, allergic to um, exposition. And it makes his stories all that more compelling. Uh, Wind River and Hell or High Water are just absolute gems. Uh, Wind River is a tougher watch, for sure, than Hell or High Water in, in terms of brutality. On the flip side, a neo-western more in the classic sense is called Slow West, and it stars Michael Fassbender and um, that kid who's in that western with Benedict Cumberbatch right now, Cody Smith oh. McPhee, and uh, hour and 20 minutes, and you feel like you've watched a five-episode epic, and that's in a good way. Thank you. So, uh, anybody else got any last minute throws? I mean, we could we could go around and around because there's just <laughs> dozens yeah, and dozens. Oh yeah, there's that one too. <laughs> that we might leave this up to a part two though. Yeah, like, we might come back and revisit this theme. Um, I think there are some other themes this year also uh, we plan to revisit. So keep a lookout for us. Yes. In terms of soundtracks. <laughs> Slow West. Um, uh, oh, well, sorry. Wind River and Hell or High Water are both soundtracks by Nick Cave, Moore, and Ellis, and they're breathtaking. I forgot who did Slow West, but it's also a gorgeous soundtrack. Sorry. Hell or High Water <laughs> has some uh, great music in it. Uh, there's one song that I listen to constantly, but uh, there's a song. What was that movie with Ben Affleck and he like? Was it The Accountant? Or he played the one like, he directed? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, there, no, the count was directed by Gavin O'Connor. Oh, there's a song at the end of that movie that says, that, that talks about, I'm just trying to leave something for my family or something like that. I'll, I'll give it to you guys and we'll put it in the description for everyone watching. But that song would have been perfect at the end of Hell, High, or Hell or High Water. Because it just talks about like, like just this guy just trying to make money for his family. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what Hell or High Water was. Since we're talking about sound soundtracks before we go um, like quit it for the day, um, since Ben mentioned Gladiator, there's the song We Are Free which every time I hear it, I feel like crying. It is gorgeous. We should probably do a soundtrack yeah. episode, but yeah, yeah. Well, Gladiator. Yeah. There's talk that Gladiator 2, which is actually a real movie that's coming what? out. That oh. It might be around. <laughs> Ridley can make like three movies a year yeah. now. The guy's incredible. <laughs> um, he basically, Jodie Comer dropped out of Kit Bag, and the next day he hired um, uh, uh, Sister Margaret from The Crown. Oh, uh, God. Oh, Vanessa, God. Vanessa Kirby. Oh. But uh, yes, now we are free. This one where, where Jem and Hunzo leaves at the end of the movie, and he might be the star of the next Gladiator. Wow. Yeah. So. Best song from a movie, Hercules, right? I can go the distance. Oh, <laughs> yes. I, I love that. I can, yeah, that's a good song. But it's funny, like, a lot of cartoons I find have some of the best soundtracks. They have bangers. Believe it or not. And they Go to the bangers. Distance is an awesome song. Yeah. So. That's that's a hype song. That is a hype that's song. That's a song I built out every time Look, somebody comes on. Once you watch The Last Dragon, that soundtrack and be singing it all the time. So it's clearly perfect. this is a this is a podcast watch that we need to do. Adonis we'll... Creed's entrance in <laughs> Russia in Creed 2. Love it. Love it. Yeah. All right.
I think we'll, start, <laughs> we'll definitely probably talk about soundtracks at the later date. About today by the National and, and Warrior. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. You done? Yes. For now. We grew up at midnight by the Maccabees and Steve Jobs. Sorry. We're good. Oh, and the Muses song from Hercules. Oh, like we talk about We Are the Muses. <laughs> oh, no, that's a great one. That yeah. is a good one. Agreed. Agreed. The Sam Lee song in King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. <laughs> the Devil and the Huntsman. That's what it's called. Okay, we're good. Anybody else? Lewis, you want to jump in too? <laughs> Lenny rolled in licorice pizza. Oh, Lewis is nice. like, Lewis you is saw like, it? Yeah. How was it? It was awesome. Oh, I have to see that. 35 millimeter too. Oh, <laughs> and the the rescuers, the opening song where it's like from the perspective of the bottle floating in the water with the lemon. Clearly, we need a Disney episode. Uh, I, don't, yes. I don't remember the rescuers. Oh, like um, it's called That's Who Will Rescue movie. Me. It was oh, it's such a gorgeous. Yeah, I love the rescuers. It's like, I cry every time I watch that that film. But I'm we're, I'm we're done now. The genie song, the first genie song. <laughs> well, clearly, we need Good a Disney stuff. episode, and we need a soundtrack <laughs> episode. We didn't even touch on Mulan yet. Make Don't a man look. out of you. I mean, that's. Oh. Version, the, the movie version, the Jackie Chan version. Wait, Jackie Chan covers it? Uh, DVD years later, Jackie oh, Chan boy. did a cover of it. It was not good. Oh, I mean, <laughs> definitely not, not good. good. I listened to some of his 80s albums, and they're pretty fun. I, I did not like it. I was just like, what is this? <laughs> Phil Collins' entire Tarzan soundtrack. Oh, yes. yeah, You'll Be Brilliant. In My Heart. It's so oh. funny that they just got Phil Collins to make an album for that. Yep. He made two. And he, just, he like snorted 80 pounds of cocoa. <laughs> he he did Tarzan and he did Brother Bear. Yep. Oh, he did Brother Bear, oh, too? Mm-hmm. I've never seen B- Brother Bear. It Why like, has no one seen it Brother Bear? Favorite, <laughs> it was like five, but then I never saw it again. Best use of David Bowie in a movie. Go. Oh, wow. Glorious Bastards? <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the cat yeah, people. Yeah. The Martian? Uh, what was that movie with Dane DeHaan? That was the space movie by the uh, fallen Luke Besson. Oh, what was that? Like uh, Galarian? Valerian? Or Great something? use of Bowie. God, we have a, we'll just go another hour. Let's just go another hour. I want to do another hour. <laughs> we, we, we could have this as like, you know, an epilogue. It's always like, or outtakes. That last really time. Cool. <laughs> Previously, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is where the fights begin. That joke cuts here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. All right. Are you, are you done? You got it out of your system? We're, we're, we're well, clearly we're going to need to make a Disney episode, and we're going to just need to make a soundtrack episode. If not, Karen all... O's Immigrant Song in 2011's Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I know it's not originally her song. <laughs> Okay. I'd have done. to listen to that. I don't remember that. I've only seen that movie a couple times. No, oh, it's Fincher's best. Yeah. The feel bad movie of Christmas. Yep, best trailer of all time. <laughs> you think that's Fincher's best? Interesting. By far. We could have a whole episode about what's David Fincher's best. Yep. Zodiac. Yeah, Zodiac's great. Yeah. Going yeah. Ted Cruz? Couldn't <laughs> 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 that one. Boots. <laughs> all right. So, we have lots of plans for the new years, clearly, and it's just going to keep getting better from here on out. It's a new us, it's a new podcast, it's a new year. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe, share it with your friends. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.